Welcome to the Reformed Stoic Podcast. Have a seat. Grab a drink. Here we discuss politics, religion, current events, philosophy, and everything else that matters. Pull up a chair. Get cozy. I'm your host, Reformed Stoic. Let's get started. Hello, hello, hello. How are we doing, my friends? Okay. We are making history today. This is the first podcast I'm doing that's not happening live. This is pre-recorded. So I don't have any chat to read or anything, but that's fine. That really hasn't been much of a thing in the past. Um, I imagine it's going to be very similar to my other podcasts. Other than the fact that there's just like a huge clunk when I banged the mic stand into the laptop. I'll be interested to see how that sounds live. Maybe I'll watch it with you. I'm thinking about just like, I've like never watched any of my podcasts. Listening to myself talk kind of makes me cringe but really like in the podcast format I don't know I'll I'll probably go ahead and watch it live with you guys tonight interact with the chat a little bit I watch all my other videos so what the hey um I don't imagine this is going to be too long for you tonight a little bit about what's going on with me I took melatonin last night so I could get a good sleep and boy oh boy did I get too good of a sleep I slept for like 10 hours that is not what was supposed to happen didn't wake up till 2.30. It's good Friday today. Um, I got my oatmeal and my coffee going. After that's over, I'm going to try to go pretty much the entire day without eating. I'm going to probably eat some dinner or something. It's rough with fasting. Uh, you're supposed to fast on Ash Wednesday. You're supposed to fast on Good Friday. What constitutes fasting? People at church are making it sound like you're you're not supposed to eat anything all day. I've done that before, like two times in the past. I'm I'm doing something, man. I'm gonna put in a good effort. After the oatmeal's gone, I'm not gonna eat anything until like 10 p.m. or something, or nine. We'll see what happens, guys. Uh, I'm taking it seriously, as you all know. I am not streaming for all of Lent. But we are going to do these podcasts. Uh, It almost didn't happen today. I was almost going to back out for a combination of it being Good Friday and from sleeping in. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get it going for the new segment. You're listening to the Reform Stoic News Segment. Let's go. Alrighty, my friends. Alrighty, let's go ahead and do this. Hopefully, I remember how to do this. Um, it's really not that complicated, but as you know, my last podcast was on Fusion Centers, Shadow CIA. That was a pretty important podcast. If you haven't seen that, I definitely recommend that you go find it in my live tabs. It is the last podcast that I've done until now. So, what do we got, gang? We're going to go ahead and start out with Russia expected to launch heavy military strike on Ukraine for one year mark of invasion. We'll see what that's about. Tonight, CBS News has learned that the U.S. believes Russia will mark the one-year anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine with a barrage of missile and drone strikes. CBS's Charlie Daggett was in Ukraine one year ago when Russia launched the largest ground invasion since World War II. And he reports tonight from Kyiv. Today, Ukrainian troops withstood relentless Russian bombardment in Vuladar, south of Bakhmut which has been reduced to smoldering ruins after months of heavy battle. This is what Russia's lightning advance has come to. A grinding crawl, a far cry from a year ago, when U.S. intelligence predicted the capital, Kyiv, would fall within 96 hours. We are on the balcony of our safe house in Kyiv at around 5 a.m., 
when Russian President Vladimir Putin announced the start of a special military operation. Moments later, thunderous explosions echo throughout the country. The Russians had launched airstrikes across the nation and ground offensives on multiple fronts. When Russian forces advanced toward the capital, hundreds of thousands tried to flee. We tried to stop the panic in our streets. People will be fleeing to the, to the border, and it will be the obstacle for our armed forces to move quickly. On those streets of Kyiv, President Volodymyr Zelensky made it clear he was staying put. Instead, he urged citizens to take up arms, which they did by the thousands. Hastily erected barricades and checkpoints went up everywhere, manned by jittery volunteers with guns drawn. Overnight, the lives of millions of Ukrainians changed forever. And the global repercussions of Russia's invasion now extend far beyond the battlefields of Ukraine. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky expressed his gratitude to President Biden during his unannounced visit here this week for America's support and weapons. But Nora, frontline soldiers tell us they're running out of ammunition in the face of a new Russian offensive. Charlie Daggett, thank you. Boy, you know, this is the first time that I've had uh, oatmeal in a very long time. I put a frozen banana in it and it helps it cool down faster and then you kind of mix it in, and then the whole thing tastes like banana. Got cinnamon, honey in there, a little bit of brown sugar. Good stuff. Okay, so, you know, ultimately, guys, looking through the options for news today, I didn't I didn't really want to give away my formula for the podcast, but let's just say it's something along the lines of typing news into YouTube and then just kind of, like, pulling up whatever looks interesting. It is a clip under five minutes. Um... Everything these days is just kind of about the war. This is ultimately why I decided to like at least take some time away from the podcast. War is serious business, man. I don't really want to be Mr. Like, oh, I'm going to take you guys through every single step of the war. There's all kinds of guys out there doing that. Um, it's an ugly thing. Let's take a look at some of the comments. Trump, I went in yesterday and there was a television screen and I said, this is genius. Putin declares a big portion of the Ukraine of Ukraine. Putin declares it as independent. Oh, that's wonderful. Trump said, okay. It takes real courage and character to work through and resolve conflict peacefully with adversaries. Putin and the Russian people have neither. Okay. Let's take a look at the responses to that. Ukrainians are brave soldiers and they know exactly what they are doing. Glory to Ukraine. Tell Biden to mind his business and keep us out of it. Yeah, it's just kind of nothing burgers, guys. You know, this war is going on. I think a lot of people find it very mysterious because, well, there's some kind of hefty conspiracy theories out there. Some people are suggesting this war is some sort of, uh, I don't know, not really what it appears to be. I'm not going to act like I know anything about that. And I really don't, guys. I really don't. There's all kind of little whispers in the wind, people trying to tell you, oh man, all the wars are fake. I think, what I think is that the wars are happening maybe for reasons beyond our understanding, or if there are reasons that are not beyond our understanding, it amounts to something along the lines of like controlling the populations of the world through fear, um, population control, because people really are being sent to die. Kind of like the movie Ants, you know, where they go fight those giant bugs because it just, like, kills lots of soldiers. But again, I don't want to be immature. This is why I get kind of tired of covering the war because it's just, like, I'm not going to act like I have some big, important, edgy opinion on this. It's war. It's been going on for a while now. If it escalates, um, it's not going to just be something that we all chit-chat about. It's going to be something that involves our lives and puts us at risk as well. So I think it's something to be taken very seriously. Poor animals and the elderly. I wish this would end. Can we think about the animals, people? Wrinkles and rug don't want to go to war. They just want to eat wet food and dry food. Uh, Ukraine must finish the job on the field because foreign support, including that of the U.S., is fickle and myopic. 
They'll take the first chance available at Ukraine's Daytonization. See, clearly there's lots of people out there who love to have commentary on the war. Say, oh yeah, boys, it's coming. It's coming, buckos. Get that silver. Yeah, seen it a million times. I was a nam. So, uh, yeah, war. Putin, Ukraine, all the war people. Still going, still happening. Oh, look at this chud. CBS News, judge rules Trump can be deposed in ex-FBI official suits. I'm loving it. FBI, those are our buddies, guys. Two million air fryers recall the more. My air fryers! Uh-oh. Am I going to have to... Are they going to recall my air fryer? It sure makes really good salmon, I'll tell you that much. All right, here we go. CBS News. Drumpf. <laughs> This is CBS News Flash. I'm Chanel Call in New York. A federal judge has ruled that former President Donald Trump may be deposed in lawsuits filed by two former FBI officials. The ex-employees allege they were targeted for retribution after a probe into Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election. Two million Kasori air fryers have been recalled over reports of burns and property damage. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission is urging consumers to immediately stop using the appliances. And Rihanna returns to the state. That's not the kind of air fryer I have. I got, I think mine's ultimately like pretty budget, pretty cheap. Any, re any recipe where they tell you to preheat it, that basically just means that I got to go a couple minutes longer or whatever at the same temperature, but... Works like a charm, man. From what I can tell, the only reason you'd want one of these fancier ones is because they're bigger and you could fit more food in there. Sometimes if I'm trying to cook too much stuff, it causes a little bit of problems, but hey, man, it's working like a charm. I probably will get a bigger, fancier one someday. Age this time at the Oscars. The pop star will sing Lift Me Up from Black Panther Wakanda Forever at the 95th Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Let's go, Rihanna. Let's go. Are we loving this, guys? The podcasts are back, baby. And more importantly, Rihanna's back, baby. Oh, I know you saw her at the Super Bowl, Chuds. Listen, Chuds. People like Rihanna are who we want to see at the Super Bowl. You probably want to see Kid Rock at the Super Bowl with his toxic Americanism. I got some news for you, Chuds. You're going to see a lot more of Rihanna, and if you don't like it, good. You're going to see a lot more of Wakanda forever, and if you don't like it, good. Punch air, Chuds. Academy Awards on March 12th. For more, download the CBS News app on your cell phone or connected TV. Look at this freaking eye. Nyeh. Rihanna will be back, Chuds. It is the era of Rihanna and Wakanda forever. You will be destroyed. Watch the Oscars, though, chuds, because you're killing our ratings. I'm Chanel Call, CBS News, New York. Hey, Chanel Call, I might give you a call. All right, let's get it. Let's go. When will O'Biden be questioned about blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline starting World War III? <laughs> just like a random boomer just blurted out something that has absolutely nothing to do with the video, Biden, the pipeline, bucko, that has nothing to do, everybody's mad, guys, you see how everybody's just, like, mad and salty, and we've been getting dragged through this war timeline for a year, and there's so many people out there, it's all about being an intellectual, that's the thing, we want to be intellectuals over here, and I basically just stopped my podcast in its tracks, because it's like, I don't want to aid in the war fear news op like i don't want to drag everybody through anger and fear while this war rages on there's a lot of people out there who you know every every day at 5 p.m sharp they turn on the news and they drink their whatever there's a lot of people who's just a very important part of their life to watch news mainstream news and uh, you're basically being forced to be upset right now and uh, that's bad times CBS News had to combine two headlines to make it a story. Yeah, that I watched that for the Trump headline, which came and went so fast, I don't even really know what it was about. So, wait, what did Trump do? Trump can be deposed in an ex FBI official suit? I don't. Even, that doesn't even sound like it makes sense. Federal judge has ruled that former President Donald Trump may be questioned in lawsuits filed by two former FBI officials who allege they were targeted for retribution after a probe. 
Well, they think they're gonna retribute us. We got a sue drumpf. Oh, FBI. Don't you guys get like pepper sprayed and waterboarded and stuff? You can't handle a little bit of retribution, chuds. Well, we don't want that. We don't we don't want we do not encourage retribution against the FBI over here. I don't even feel comfortable saying retribution. No days of retribution around here. Please take me off the watch list. Alrighty. He will take the fifth. Okay then. Aloha Friday. We'll get him this time. Distraction. Dude, all of the news is a distraction. It's a distraction from living your life, bro. Watch the... I'm going to probably watch The Two Towers today, Lord of the Rings. I don't know if that's entirely appropriate for Good Friday. Man, I enjoyed The Fellowship of the Ring. Man, that's the most... That's the best viewing I've had since I watched it in sixth grade in theaters. Um... I'm tempted to, like, make some sort of a video talking about it or something. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Tolkien was a Roman Catholic. I'll just start by saying that. All right, let's move on. We're making good time. I don't I don't really expect this to go very long. Rare blizzard warnings issued in Southern, Southern California. Let's go. Two severe winter storms sweeping across the nation. In Southern California, a rare blizzard warning has been issued. Maria Virial is live in Los Angeles County. Good morning, Maria. Hey, Michael, I'm about 30 miles north of Los Angeles off the five freeway. And as you can see, things are moving very slowly, if at all. And that's because this highway has been shut down. A major thoroughfare in California, hundreds of cars just idling because of this winter storm creating treacherous road conditions. This morning, two major winter storms unleashing its fury from coast to coast, bringing heavy snow, biting winds and extreme cold. In the West, a rare blizzard bearing down on Southern California. San Bernardino preparing for a once in a generation blizzard warning. While LA County getting its first blizzard warning in more than 30 years, a rare sight in the city of stars. We almost never see this, maybe once in a decade if we're lucky. And as you come around, you see the Hollywood sign, you see just enough to sprinkle the hillside here. And over in the Midwest, more record snow fell. Dangerous roads leading to close calls like this one. In Michigan, scenes like this. Nearly one million customers left without power after downed trees and power lines. This football coach helping a police officer clear right. a road blocked by a tree. What's your name? Cooper. Cooper, nice to meet you. Yeah. This video showing an explosion Whoa. in northern Illinois after a tree fell on a transformer. Wow. In Wisconsin, two empty cars were crushed after a parking lot collapsed. And while it remains under investigation, authorities say snow is likely a factor. The powerful system also moved through the Northeast. New York State receiving freezing rain overnight. While in Massachusetts, Boston dealing with icy conditions and black ice. Officials are predicting that the worst is yet to come. Snow expected throughout the evening in parts of Los Angeles County. Let me tell you guys, if you're stuck in this, you might as well just get comfy because it may be a while before the highway opens back up, if at all, today. Get comfy, you say. What do you think, guys? Can we get comfy? Let's go. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for Okay. A little bit of cold weather, a little bit of, uh, man, what's up with California and like disasters? Doesn't it seem like California is always either burning down or freezing or just chaos? Like, I don't know if God likes California very much, guys. I think he does. I think he loves a lot of people all over the world. Moving on. My prayers goes out to everyone going through the winter storm. Yep. Wow, I've never seen that in my whole lifetime. Hope everyone affected will be okay. Yep, 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 yep. I do feel sorry for these people. They don't have the equipment or the experience for this kind of weather. Help me. All I know is how to go to Starbucks. It's like, wait, so go to Starbucks? No, get off the road. <laughs> They're helpless. The poor helpless Californians. All I know how to do is like whatever people do in California they all they know how to do is vote left and uh have man buns and go to Starbucks pray for them boys they're helpless okay moving on 
NBC News on board as U.S. surveillance flight intercepted by Chinese fighter jet. The Virgin U.S. surveillance flight versus the Chad Chinese fighter jet. Let's go. We're in the cockpit of a U.S. Navy P-8 Poseidon aircraft doing a surveillance flight high over the South China Sea, flying over man-made islands that China has been fortifying, but the U.S. considers unlawful. I mean, what is this, dude? You got, you got like a reporter? We're doing surveillance over China, chuds. And then, yeah, like, oh my gosh, it's intercepted by... What? Pika insert Pikachu face when the Chinese intercept jet flies by. It's like, what? You can't intercept us. We're America. I mean, you want to talk about, like, entitled and unprepared. It's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure, like, China is just not really going to let us get away with that. Unchecked, man. I don't even want to say what I think about our country right now. I just feel like our whole country is just not prepared for anything. Here we go. Moving on. <laughs> and we're not talking about rocky little outcrops. One of the islands is 700 acres. It's been described as an unsinkable aircraft carrier with a runway, uh, radar bases, and possibly... Sur we're doing surveillance, chuds. This is what happens when you have a real job like me. I'm a strong career woman. Oh, no, we're getting intercepted. Wow, why? Surface to air missiles. Uh, the militarization of these islands is one part of China's challenge to U.S. influence in the region. During the flight today, the PLA was calling from its ground station to the pilots here, warning the aircraft uh, to leave what it considered its airspace, saying American aircraft no more approaching, you will bear full responsibility. And then uh, the flight was intercepted by a Chinese J-11 fighter jet. It stayed about 500 feet off the left wing for over an hour. It just followed and it was close. We could see the pilots. Uh, the encounter in the Navy's words was professional. Uh okay, this is kind of confusing. NBC News on board as U.S. surveillance flight intercepted. So this woman is NBC News, and she's on board a flight. So I was under the impression, like, it was going to happen live, like, in the middle of her news segment. But I guess she's on another flight reporting about the news on a flight. What This is so, like, confusing. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, but these sort of encounters are happening more often. Uh, a more assertive China, along with deeper ties to Russia, as well as the positioning on Taiwan, is opening a new front here. And it has the U.S. and allies in the region now beefing up defenses, like that recent deal to have access to four new military bases in the Philippines. The question is, with this standoff uh, in the South China Sea, which is still at a distance, uh, how can it be resolved without a conflict? Okay, well, that was special. I do have to say we do the same thing when everyone else comes too close in a plane. It happens in Alaska, over the Atlantic, and Arctic all the time. I trust pilots more than I trust their leaders anyway. It's all fun and games until the jet says, hey, you remember that weather balloon, right? <laughs> Just seeing what real surveillance looks like. Huh. I feel like everything about that was very strange. Okay, let's keep it going, boys. China calls for Russia-Ukraine ceasefire. Peace talks. Well, that sounds good to me. Let's get it. China has supported Putin and Russia, but has for the most part remained on the sidelines militarily. But in recent days, the communist country has hinted at a more active role and has now put forward a 12-point peace proposal. However, most of the points were very general and did not contain specific proposals to end the war. Hong Kong correspondent Richard Kimber has more on the details of that memo. This proposal from China's foreign ministry calls on the international community to do everything it can to de-escalate the situation and to enable peace talks between the two sides. It specifically says that uh, the territorial integrity and sovereignty of all countries must be upheld, but it balances that by also saying uh, that unilateral sanctions being applied uh, as part of efforts to deal with this uh, crisis must be removed. Uh, that's seen as being a uh, criticism of the United Nations and the US for placing sanctions on Russia. There's also uh, further support for Russia in the sense that the plan uh, outlines the fact that it believes that security concerns that Russia has over the expansion of military 
military blocs, understood to be a reference to NATO, must also be taken seriously. This proposal comes as China continues to try to portray itself as a neutral actor with regards to the Ukraine conflict and a peace broker. It has repeatedly said that it does not support the invasion, but it has also uh, abstained from a recent United Nations resolution to call for an end to the conflict. There is also increasing scrutiny over China's longer-term intentions with regards to its relationship with Russia after high-profile trips to Moscow in the past few days from China's top diplomat Wang Yi and expectations that that will be followed up by a trip to Moscow to meet with President Vladimir Putin from China's President Xi Jinping. During his time in Moscow, China's top diplomat Wang Yi said that the relationship between China and Russia was as solid as a rock and can stand the test of international risks. Political analysts here also note the fact that during the course of this one-year conflict, President Xi Jinping of China is understood to have spoken to Vladimir Putin four times, but has never yet spoken to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Richard Kimber for Scripps News in Hong Kong. Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie to you. I wasn't really paying attention to that. Just like some talking head, something about peace. I feel like there's no peace, guys. Remember Independence Day with the alien guy, scientist dude who was possessed by the alien. No peace. I just don't think there's peace. Hopefully, there's peace though. Peace be with you, and also with you. Chud. All right. Um, a well-timed feign to contrast the saber rattling happening in the Pacific, a grain of sand on the beach to justify the waves. I assume China will point back to this when they eventually invade Taiwan and will say, see what you made us do. We didn't want this. This could have been handled peacefully. Yeah, you see, there you go. Like talks of more invasions. Let's all pray for peace as always. But, <clears throat> you know, I've been around. Not that long. People, that's the thing. Like, nobody ever says you're old. People still say, you're young, you're young, you're young. Your whole life is ahead of you. By the time you're old, like, you'll have been told you were young your entire life. I feel like 31 is um, on the way. You know, I'm not getting any younger. I've been around. My opinion, for what it's worth, I don't think peace is coming. But that's negativity. So, let's, let's pray for peace, as always. The plot thickens. Whoever would have expected that? Yay, hopefully we can all stop this madness and enjoy our lives. I don't know, what do you think, guys? You think this guy's got it all figured out? Grimdock? Grimdock! Yeah, why don't you just go play World of Warcraft, little buddy? I'm pretty sure... <laughs> it's over! There's a reason you play World of Warcraft all the time. Territorial integrity and sovereignty must be upheld. Slowly looks at Taiwan and Hong Kong. Yep. Peace, peace, and peace. There's no winner or loser. The real winner is whoever has the peace. I have peace. Winner? Beautiful message. We don't need any BS wars. Okay. Okay. Well, we are to our last video, my friends. Um, We are 28 minutes deep into this podcast. Very short. Very, 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 very short podcast. From everything that I feel like I've seen how this is going today, this seems like it's the future of the podcast. <laughs> everything ran very smooth. Um, instead of the chat, I have the audio levels. What I'm doing is I just have the very peak of the audio from the videos. So I'm able to just see... If it's clipping or if it's too quiet so I can adjust the audio easily. Things just running so smoothly, you know, no issues or lag. I'm looking at the CPU load. CPU load has been manageable the entire time. From what I can tell, my friends, this seems like it's the future of the podcast. This is just so much more professional. As much as I love being able to interact with the chat, you know, there's there's a long history of like not so favorable not so favorable people popping up in my chat and uh, it's not like you could ever really read the chat that well when it was on the screen that was for me to read which ultimately is just you know cluttering things up I mean why would you want to have a chat on screen that nobody can read except for me and at best if you can read it you're seeing things in the chat that maybe shouldn't be visible in my podcast so I'm, I'm feeling like this is the future of the podcast my friends you know we'll see how these uh, podcasts go over Lent Monday and Friday, the plan is to premiere them at 5.30 
p.m. my time, 6.30 p.m. PST, Monday and Friday. Maybe somewhere down the line after Lent, we can go back to the podcast three days a week. I really did enjoy um, I really did enjoy doing the podcast in the past, and I thought that they had great potential. But, um, I mean, when this runs this smoothly, and I'm just able to effortlessly, you know, there's no lag or nothing screwing up, my computer isn't dying, there's no connection that could possibly fail, I've had some serious, like, buffering issues... This is like, I'm able to run like a professional tier podcast, you know, I'm going to like throw it up before I upload it. I can put it in iMovie and like master the audio or if I made any mistakes, I can edit them out. I'm thinking this is the future of the podcast, guys. So sorry. Um, As far as like donations and super chats, that would be the one thing. But you know what? We're, We're not grifters around here. You guys can do donations and super chats for my live streams, which I will be thinking about the future of as well over Lent because um, changes are happening. This is forcing change in my platform, and so far, I'm thinking it's all good. All right, what makes Good Friday good? Ascension presents Today is Good Friday. I'll bet there's some really great Catholics out there who have been doing it. A lot longer than me, and you're laughing at me and drinking my coffee and eating my oatmeal. Um, I I like fasting. I'm probably gonna do more fasting even on days that aren't because it's supposed to be Ash Wednesday fast all day. From what I can tell, like you just don't eat all day. I mean, I know there's some Catholics doing it like that. Good Friday fast all day. You don't eat anything all day. And then every Friday for the rest of Lent, you don't have any meat. So I'll make sure to jump on that. And um, I mean, it sounds like that's it. I guess I'm a little bit confused. We'll see what this guy has to say. But um, yeah, you know, I did. I I put off eating for a while. I just let myself become hungry. And then I stay in that feeling for like four or five hours. You know, on a regular day when I get hungry, I eat. And for Ash Wednesday, it's like, hey, I'm hungry. Let's not eat for like three or four hours. That was how I did it this time. Um, I'll try to do better next year. But uh, I feel pretty good about, you know, some of the things I'm doing for Lent. So anyway, it's not all about me. Let's go ahead and get this going. Ascension presents What Makes Good Friday Good. Here we go. Hey, I'm Father Mark Mary with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. And this is Ascension Presents. Today I like to wrestle with the good of Good Friday. And I'd like to begin sort of with a disclaimer because this video is going to have a little bit more gravitas, a little bit more heaviness than our videos normally do, and probably a little bit more gravitas than you're normally looking for when you're coming to YouTube or Facebook to watch a video. But I think if there was ever a day to go there, it's today. At the same time, if there was ever a day which merited the title bad, wouldn't it be the day on which the creator of the world, um, the king, the savior, where became flesh, was crucified and killed um, by its creation? And I remember wrestling with this mystery of the good of Good Friday, kind of for the first time, um, at least very sort of intentionally, as a seminarian. Because there's a natural part of being a seminarian when you think about what you would say um, as a priest in the future. And so it was one Good Friday, and I was thinking about what homily I want to give. And I remember wanting to go, my instinct was to go kind of deep, dark, and heavy, and just stay there. Just stay there until the Easter Vigil. Um, But I was wrong. And I was corrected by the liturgy of the church and the wisdom of the church which still dares to call this day good. Good Friday. And I'd like to approach and wrestle with this mystery in two parts. First of all, I'll begin with this question. Like, how did we get here? How did we get to this moment? And a couple times in this talk we'll be going to we'll be taking some quotes um, from church documents. And this first one, I want to go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Here's part of the answer according to the Catechism 
sinners were the authors and ministers of all the sufferings that the, the, the divine Redeemer endured. Um, who are sinners? You and I. And it goes on. We must regard as guilty all those who continue to relapse into their sins. Since our sins made the Lord Christ suffer the torment of the cross. Uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, I remember hearing him say in a talk once that during the Mass where we are to call to mind our sins, as opposed to making a list of his faults, he would simply look at the crucifix because he recognized in the crucifix the effect of his sin. And it's the crucifix which dispels the lie that our sins are without consequence, that our sins have no effect. Upon the cross we see the effect of our sins, but we do not stop there. We do. And I'll just go ahead and try to break this up a little bit, guys, so I'm not grifting off of this guy's video. <clears throat> Feeling the effects of your sins. Um, seeing through the illusion that your sins have no consequences. Now, this is something that's always awkward to talk about. I feel like this podcast has been pretty solid so far. I hate to ruin it with talks of masturbation. But as I was getting ready to go off on my hiatus from streaming into Lent, a lot of people jokingly, but at the same time making a good point, were saying, hey, are you going to stop cranking it? Are you going to stop cranking it? Well, my friends, I'm getting very close to staving that habit off to more like once every other day. And I managed to go a couple of days this week without. I went without it on Ash Wednesday. I'd like to think I could go without it today. And now here's what happened yesterday when I kind of like fell off the wagon, so to speak. I got this, and I've, I remember feeling this before other times. I got this like feeling in my head, this like heaviness in my head. It made me fall down for a nap. And when I woke up from that nap, I had like this very cold feeling in the back of my head. And I think what it was is I was able to notice the flow of dopamine or oxytocin, these kind of like chemicals, these happy, feel good oxytocin dopamine chemicals I was able to feel the effects they're having like it's a it's a strong flow of these happy chemicals and it was very much more noticeable I mean it, other times it's just not nor noticeable when you're doing it every day multiple times a day you don't notice that feeling and it slows you down. It kind of like, it's like being hit with a little tranquilizer dart or something. And uh, I don't want to ruin my podcast with talks of this, but this is something that men struggle with. I think this is probably one of the main things that men struggle with, because guess what, chuds? Um, you are not supposed to be doing that. You are supposed to refrain. The only sexual activity you are supposed to be having at all is with your wife. And if you're not married, then you're just not supposed to be doing it. And people like Vatican Catholics say, you need to um, confess to a priest every time it happens. It's a mortal sin every time it happens. And if you die without confessing to a priest for that mortal sin, you will go to hell. I think that's very extreme. But... Even if I don't necessarily believe that, I like that direction as opposed to the reformed direction where it's like, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Because what do we do when things are fine and we don't worry about it? We give in to sin. You should start fighting it. And I'm going to start fighting it. And um, as far as the question, are you going to stop cranking it for Lent? We'll see what happens. I have been noticing the habit is kind of like falling back a little bit it's uh I'm kind of getting the idea of what it's like to get through a day without doing that and I'm strategizing and we're getting prepared for a siege on this bad habit I'd love to get it out of my life you guys but easier said than done 
as people know, let's just keep praying. Let's just keep doing what we do, my friends. All right, let's go. Do not stop there. That's not the whole story spoken to us on this Good Friday from this crucifix. Um, why our sin, but why also God's love? By this we know love, that while we were still sinners, he loved us. Um, and it is from the crucifix that these beautiful words fall from the lips of our beautiful God. Um, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Today you will be with me in paradise. I thirst. Um, from this crucifix, in the midst of such darkness, ugliness, and pain and suffering, Jesus still continues to love us, to desire to thirst for our love, to desire to be with us in paradise, to be with us for eternity. He desires to forgive us of our sins. So here's the thing, brothers and sisters, if you are wrestling with sin to such an extent that you're tempted to despair of God's mercy, the ugliness of your sin, the darkness of your sin, the heaviness of your sin tempts you to give up, reject that lie. Reject that lie. The Lord God loves you. He loves you despite your sinfulness. He desires to forgive you whatever the sin is that you've committed because He desires to be with you and with me for eternity. My brothers and sisters, forgiveness is possible. You are loved. You are known. You are pursued by God. Now let's transition. We've looked at basically the relationship of our sins to His suffering. But now I'd like to take a look at the relationship between our suffering and God. You and I, we experience suffering in countless ways. Um, maybe you suffer with illness, um, sickness, maybe you've been the victim of some evil committed by another, um, you've experienced loss. And the instinct is to cry out to God and to echo these words of Jesus, my God, my God, uh, why have you forsaken me? Um, and this is what John Paul II writes. Again, forgive me for giving a bit of a, a longer quote. Um, for man does not put this question to the world, the question of suffering, though it is from the world that suffering often comes, but he, but he puts it to God, but he puts it to God as creator and Lord of the world. So how do we respond to this question, to this mystery? And again, uh, I think it's important to admit that confronting this reality, the reality and the mystery of suffering, words have limits. And that's why one of these, there's this quote, Lumen Fidei, the first encyclical of Pope Francis. He writes, to those who suffer, God does not provide arguments which explain everything. Rather, his response is that of an accompanying presence, a history of goodness which touches every story of suffering and opens up a ray of light. Like, my brothers and sisters, God is with you. God is with you. God is with you. And while words are not enough, especially if they're divorced from a loving, um, compassionate presence, they can nonetheless be helpful to educate us and to bring us to the truth. And the truth is this, is that our sufferings endured with Christ are given meaning and power and a salvific meaning and power. We share in the redeeming suffering of Christ. That's why the church dares to speak of the gospel of suffering, the good news of suffering. Okay, so I've been trying to construct this metaphor in my head and uh, here's what I got my friends for Protestant view of salvation that you know everything's basically everything's fine Jesus Christ died for our sins and you don't really have to worry about it which I which I think is a straw man Protestants would be frustrated at me saying that but Protestants put all the emphasis on the atonement of Christ and I just feel like what it results in is a much less heavy emphasis on cutting sin out of your life. 
And then the Catholic view that you should be actively trying to remove sin from your life. I feel like if it's like you have a wealthy friend and they offer you to borrow their car for a road trip, you're going to take a car on a road trip. It's like, hey, you know what, man? Here's the keys to my Cadillac. Have a great time. And listen, buddy, if, if, you know, if you come back and the tank's empty and the wheels are flat and there's dings on the car, you know, and there's damage to the interior and exterior, don't even worry about it, man. I got tons of money and um, I'll take care of it. So just go have a good time. So, so you're going on a road trip with this guy's car and I feel like people I need to stop beating up on Protestants because there's Protestants that even even feeling like salvation is through Jesus Christ alone through faith alone which very well might be the case you guys I'm still in an interesting place with my theology and my beliefs there's lots of Protestants who in spite of that they still try just as hard as a Catholic would so I feel like the Protestant view is like you show back up and the car is all beaten to crap and there's scratches on it and the tires are flat and the mirrors are broken and, and the car is just an absolute wreck. It's like, hey man, thank you so much for letting me use your car. You said it was fine if I um, treat it like garbage and don't do anything to fix it. So here you go. Here's your beaten to crap car. I'm so grateful that you said that it didn't matter if I treated it like crap. Whereas the more traditional you should try not to sin view is that even though your friend said he would atone for the damage you do to his car, you bring it back in better condition than it was given to you. It, like it's clean as a whistle, full tank of gas, and everything's looking great. It's like, man, I appreciate you so much for letting me use your car. And I know you said that it didn't matter if uh, it came back a junker, but guess what, buddy? Here it is, and it looks great, and um, I mean, that's just the way to be in life. That's just good morals. I should probably stop strawmanning Protestant theology. Regardless of what your view, regardless of your theology and denomination, I feel like that should be your attitude. And my, my stance, I should probably clarify, is that there's so much emphasis put on the atonement of Christ and salvation through faith alone in Protestant churches that, in my opinion and in my experience, it is so much easier for sin to thrive. If you have people telling you that it's fine to sin and impossible not to sin versus you need to flee away from sin, and then all of a sudden, you know, these verses where Christ is saying, like, if you're... If your left eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off. All of a sudden, those verses start to make a lot more sense. Because it's like, hey, guess what, guys? You should be doing what you can not to sin. And you will fail. You will sin sometimes. But let's start taking it seriously, regardless of your denomination. All right, let's play it out. That we can share in God's own redeeming and saving suffering. One of my favorite examples of this is there, a mother Teresa and her sisters, she began this group called her Sick and Suffering Coworkers, and these, these people with different various sicknesses and illnesses who wanted to share in mother's work, but they couldn't. It's been said that there's no greater power, that there has been, that there's no greater power in human history than prayer and suffering. So number one, it's not without meaning as it's unified with the suffering of Christ. And number two, our suffering, even death, isn't the end of the story. On the third day, he rises from the dead. Um, you know, there's a certain somebody who shall not be named who really went hard against me for suggesting that like suffering makes you holier or that Christians should suffer, that the Bible suggests that you should suffer... A special somebody went really hard on me and, you know, supposedly BTFO'd me for suggesting that the Bible says that you should suffer. I sure hear it a lot in Catholic teaching. Um, 
the mystery of suffering, the mystery of the cross. Well, I just hear it all the time in these teachings. But yeah, you know, this individual says that they're not Catholic, obviously, but I find it very interesting because I think they're great teachings. Even on Good Friday, even in the depths of profound suffering, even in the face of death itself, we remain a people of hope and a people of the resurrection. And this is what the church says. This is what the church says to end um, Good Friday on the closing, the prayer after communion, and then the final blessing. Almighty, ever living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ. And it goes on to, it goes on to say, and then the other prayer says this, May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. My brothers and sisters who suffer, and it can be a wide variety of sufferings. Christ is with you. Christ is with you. Um, he desires to give meaning to your suffering, to make it redemptive, salvific, transformative. And finally, we always keep faith and hope in the resurrection. Um, that when the story is truly finished, um, it's a story of hope, of justice, of healing, um, of eternal life and love with the Savior who loves us, who has suffered with us, and desires to live with us forever. With Him, in Him, you can do all things. My brothers and sisters, thank you for carrying your cross as well. Thank you for suffering well. Thank you for giving us this example and unleashing the redemptive power of God upon our world. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next week. Remember, we are pilgrims on this earth. Somos peregrinos. Poco a poco vamos a llegar. We're going to make it. God bless you. Thank you for suffering well. Thank you for carrying your cross. And, you know, that's something you hear a lot from all sorts of denominations. Pick up your cross. Your cross to bear. So, a, a couple of words finishing up. Why do I think that suffering would be important as a Christian? Well, because it humiliates you. It makes you humble. And being humble is the opposite of pride. And they say that pride is the worst of sins. For all other sins happen through pride. Anytime you say, hey, you know what? I know that this is a sin, but I'm going to do it anyway. That is your prideful decision to go against God. So suffering humbles you, humiliates you. I have dealt with some particular kinds of suffering ever since 2020, guys. And I feel, not to toot my own horn, I feel like I've been going through an evolution. I feel like I'm becoming a better person through this suffering. And I feel like if you don't understand that, how suffering and humili humility makes you a better person, well, you're just never going to grow. No matter how many books you read or how good of a teacher you think you are. So that's all I got to say about that. God bless you, my friends. I'm very confident that this is the future of the podcast. You know, we'll just see what happens on the other end of Lent. But uh, this was pretty smooth. This is pretty smooth, guys. So you will be seeing this in like an hour and a half. God bless you. Peace out.